Oh, the book of Samuel used to be one book. It's first and second Samuel now, but when they translated the uh, Old Testament into Greek, the Septuagint, they broke it into two books because of just the length. First Samuel has 31 chapters, second Samuel has 24 chapters, made it quite a lengthy book, so they broke it into two. And the author technically is unknown, but we believe Samuel probably wrote at least the first 24 chapters because in chapter 25, he records his death. And, of course, he's not going to be writing after his death. And so others probably took up the mantle, the baton, and, and, uh, and carried on writing. It's probably finished um, sometime during the, the, the 900s B.C. Um, we know that Samuel was born about 1100 B.C. And so uh, the time period then with David, his kingship, uh, started in about 1010 B.C., so the book of 1 Samuel covers that, uh, what we call the uh, 11th century to the first quarter of the 10th century B.C. Um, so basically the book covers the history of the three most prominent Israelite leaders at the time. Samuel, King Saul, and the beginning of David. It's interesting to note, though, that the foundation of Israel's faith was the Lord himself. He was supposed to be their ruler. And however... In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, anticipating they would be calling for a king, um, gave some instructions in Deuteronomy. I'll read this for you real quick. Chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, beginning in verse 14. Moses wrote this. He says, When you come to land the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers, you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. And then down in verses 18 to 20, he says, And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priest. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of the law, the statutes, and doing them. And that his way, his heart won't be turned away to the foreign gods, and he won't depart from the right or to the left. So Moses was giving him instructions. This is what a king would look like. He would be a man that was serving the Lord. And the primary goal then of 1 Samuel is to show the why and how they went from, remember in Judges, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, to now we have a king who is after the Lord's heart. And this is the book that kind of bridges that and shows us and Samuel's the one who's going to bridge that gap. Samuel's the one who provides solid and godly leadership up to the time of David. Right? That's just kind of a brief summary. So if we, look, if we were to outline this, um, come on here now. Oh, I know what happened. There. You know, see, sometimes these things don't do what they're supposed to do. If we were to outline this, um, we would say, if, break it into four parts. Uh, the first would be before the monarchy. So God rules and rescues his people, chapters 1 through 7. Um, the birth of Samuel, his rise as prophet, priest, and king. So that's chapters 1 through 7. The second part would be from chapters 8 to 12, the beginning of the monarchy, the people demand a king. Right? Chapters 8 through 12. And this talks about Saul's rise to be king and Samuel's warnings about that king. And the third part will be Israel's first king, the reign, and then the rejection of Saul, chapters 13 to 15. And we kind of heard some of that last week when, we, when Reverend Gunnison was here and he preached on 1 Samuel 15. And that was kind of the downfall of, uh, of King Saul. And so we have Saul against the Philistines, victory there, and then against the Amalekites, his disobedience, and then what happened, uh, his failure. And then fourthly, to end it would be chapter 16 to 31. This is the, the main gist of the last half of the a book is God's alternative king, the rise of David and the end of King Saul. And he goes, he crashes and burns. Um, basically, it's David appears and prospers while Saul loses his mind and he loses his life. And that's what happens. All right, that ends in chapter 31. So what I want to do with that outline is to kind of go through and look at some of the major events in 1 Samuel and so we'll look and see what the Lord is doing behind the scenes. And that's what we want to keep in mind here. The Lord is working to preserve his people, to keep his covenant. 
even though in the midst of sinful humans, he still comes along and makes sure that everything works out. He works through sinful people even um, as we look at Saul. But what a sad case that was. But the book opens. If you've been through 1 Samuel, you know that uh, there's a woman named Hannah. And Hannah is not able to have children. And every year they would go and offer sacrifices at the tabernacle, which is now in Shiloh. This is before Jerusalem. Shiloh is the capital. Eli was the priest. And she goes and she's praying. And the priest Eli sees her mouth moving and he actually thinks she's drunk. And he calls her over and uh, they begin to talk. And lo and behold, she ends up having a son. She said if she had a son, she would dedicate him to the Lord. This is Samuel. And so in chapter 2 is a song. It, ends, it, it begins with this uh, Hannah's prayer, which is really a song. And she's praising the Lord. And it ends with this claim. She said, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. It's a little prophetic word there, looking down the road. This is what God's going to do for the man who's serving the Lord. And chapter 2 ends with the indictment against the two sons of Eli. They're wicked. And there's a pronouncement against them that they will not stand. And then at the same time, in chapter 3, we read about the calling of Samuel. So the writer here puts this in perspective that the house of Eli is falling. Samuel's being called by the Lord. And that humorous part where in the middle of the night, he hears someone calling him. He runs. Eli says, go back to sleep. Samuel, Samuel. And ends up finally, Eli realizes his Lord calling him. And so Samuel then is called to be uh, the prophet of the Lord. And uh, chapter 4 then becomes the end of Eli and his sons as they go into battle. It doesn't even tell us who the leader is, but they go into battle against the Philistines. And they think that if they, they got defeated the first day, and they think if they had the ark, that they can take it into battle, and that would give them victory. They use the ark like a good luck charm. It's kind of like the prosperity gospel today. They can put your money in, pull the, pull the lever, and you can get something that God's going to give you because you... You had it. And so this ark becomes a good luck charm against the Philistines. So the Philistines capture the ark, and they take it to their, to their place. And they, um, it's kind of humorous in chapter 5 what happens, is they put it in the temple of their god Dagon. Now, this is in Philistine territory over by the Mediterranean. You remember Samson, at the end of uh, Judges, Samson actually had destroyed one of the temples of Dagon when he pushed the pillars and, and killed all those people. This is a different temple in Ashdod. And so they put the ark in with their god Dagon. They get up the next day, and Dagon um, is, is lying face down on the ground. Well, maybe just an accident. So they put the statue back up. The next day, they go back in. Dagon's on the ground. His head's over here. His hands are over here. And they say, we've got to get this guy out of here. You've got to get this ark out of here. And the people start breaking out in tumors. And so it's like now he's a hot potato. We've got to get rid of this ark. We don't want this because their God is with them. And so God then defends himself against the foreign gods. And you can see that. It's very humorous. Uh, and eventually, through a turn of events, it ends up back in the hands of the Israelites. And it was stored at a town called Kerith jerim uh, until it was taken to Jerusalem by King David much, much later. In chapter 7, then, Samuel becomes the leader of the Israelites. He is... The, the, really the final judge of the Israelites. And he's a judge who is leading the people in repentance, calling them back to the Lord, to serve the Lord. He is the man that God has called to do this. Um, and, and there's a battle coming up against the Philistines in chapter 7. I want to read just a little portion of Samuel, how he takes action. Uh, this is verse 3 of chapter 7. It says, Samuel said to the house of Israel, listen to, listen to his words, calling them back. He says, If you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve Him only. And He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they serve the Lord only. Remember the, the or word was at the time of Joshua to go and destroy all those four nations and they didn't do it. And so this be, can, continually becomes a thorn in the side of the Israelites having these foreigners here, and then being attacked from the outside. Um, where does this thing go? So, in chapter 8 then becomes a turning point, one of the turning points, when the people cried out for a king. 
Samuel wasn't good enough for them. The Lord wasn't good enough to lead them. He said they want a people, they want a king to lead them like all the other people around them. And the Lord tells Samuel, go ahead and do it. He said, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me as their leader. And this is found in chapter 8, just a brief part, portion of chapter 8, down in uh, verse 7 to 9. The Lord says, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say. They've not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. And then he goes on to give this, uh, telling them what a king would do to them. All right? Samuel told the words to the people, and he says, you know, this king that you want... He'll be oppressed. He'll be, he will take taxes from you. He'll take your animals. He'll take your servants. You still want him. You want him anyway. And the people said, they refuse to obey the voice of Samuel. No, but there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said, obey their voice and make them a king. So, verses nine and, chapters 9 and 10 tell the story of the call of Saul to be the first king from the tribe of Benjamin. And in chapter 11, Saul becomes king. He's ordained, anointed as king. And uh, he goes out in his first battle. They defeat the Ammonites. Saul looks like he's going to be pretty good. In fact, he even says after the victory, he says that the, uh, the Lord has given salvation. He's worked salvation in Israel. So, hey, looks like he's going to be okay. But keep in mind what Samuel had told them already and what Moses said back in Deuteronomy. This is the earthly king. You've got to watch out. He's got to be a man who's serving the Lord. And chapter 12 then. Another turning point is Samuel's farewell address. He's an older, older man now. And he reminds the people of his faithful service as a prophet and a judge and the Lord's faithfulness to Israel in the past but the people sin in asking for a king to reign over them. And he ends his address with this challenge. The same thing he's saying over and over again. Only fear the Lord, serve Him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things He's done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. So Saul is reigning. Samuel gives the word of of prophecy. Chapters 13 and 14 then displayed the beginning of the end of Saul. At a town called Gilgal, they were going in battle against the Philistines again. Uh, Saul is waiting. He's waiting. He hears nothing from the Lord. Samuel's delays in coming. This was the Lord's doing. And so Saul goes and he sacrifices. He makes unlawful sacrifices. And when Samuel gets there, he tells him, you shouldn't have done this. You should have waited on the Lord. I was coming. And as soon as he does the, the sacrifice, Samuel shows up. It's all in the Lord's timing. And in chapter 13, verse 8, it says, He waited seven days. This is talk about Saul. The time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul sees his people, his soldiers leaving, and they're frightened, and so he thought he'd take action. And Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God from which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not been obedient. Okay? So, Saul is starting that long slide, okay, into his end. And it all comes to a crashing down in chapter 15, which we had this sermon on Last week, they're fighting the, the uh, Amalekites. 
And Saul was told to completely destroy them, including their king, including all the animals. And remember, they kept some of them behind, and he kept King Agag. And Samuel comes to him, and he says this. These words end chapter 15. When Samuel comes and says, Saul, your kingdom is gone. Remember, he grabbed, the, he grabbed part of his cloak and he tore it. And he says, the Lord has torn the kingdom from your hands. And it says this, the Lord regretted he had made Saul king over Israel. All right, and we read that kind of language, we think, well, did God change his mind? Where else have we heard that God regretted something? We'd be back in Genesis, right? He said, the Lord had regretted he had made man on the earth. It's simply our way of trying to explain the changes that God makes. God doesn't regret. He already knows everything that's going to happen. He has divine foreknowledge. But that language makes us think that God changed his mind. But simply he regretted because of what's going to happen now to Saul. All right. So then on to the front of things comes this man named David, who's actually a young man at this point. He's anointed by Samuel to be the next king. And you guys know that story. Saul comes and all the sons of Jesse are brought before him. And he rejects that one and that one and that one. And we learn something about the Lord. He tells, he tells Samuel that the Lord sees differently than man does. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Remember, Moses said back in Deuteronomy that it would be the, the man after God's heart, the man who keeps God's law. And so David then is the one who's anointed to be king. And as soon as he's anointed, we learn that the Spirit rushed on him and the Spirit left King Saul. So poor old Saul now has a Spirit on him that's troublesome and comes back and, and haunts him. And he gets in these moods and it torments him. And it turns out the only thing that satisfies him, the only thing that will calm him down, is for David to play the lyre for him. And so David is called in, the, the next anointed king. See how God's working behind the scenes here. The next king is brought in to be the armor bearer of the king Saul and to play for him and to anoint him, I mean to, to satisfy him. And so what sets up then this fight against this giant Philistine named Goliath? I remember when I was on a, a mission trip in Honduras and it was, they had these little coloring books for the kids. It's Goliath. Goliath was the the Spanish for Goliath. I can still hear the kids shouting, Goliath, Goliath. And so he goes out against this giant. And we all know that story, but I wanted to read you the language. When David is confronting this giant, this conversation that takes place, chapter 17, verses 41 to 47, um, it says, A Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Small g. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And listen to the response of the anointed king. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And he says, this day the Lord will deliver, me into, deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines to the, this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. And so he says, you will know there is a God in Israel. That's the man after God's own heart. The boldness of him, putting his faith and trust in the Lord. And that's something that David did continually as we'll look as we go forward here. So then, obviously he, he slays Goliath. And the people start to praise David. You know, Saul's killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And his jealous rage comes upon Saul, and he wants to kill David. He wants him out of the picture. Remember, he's got that troubling spirit. But this is man who's been anointed a king, and he's got the Holy Spirit with him. And so David, not only is he married to Saul's daughter, but Jonathan, his son, becomes David's best friend. And they become very close friends. And it was very really helpful because when Saul begins to hunt down David as the story progresses, Jonathan would help him and tell him where his dad was and, and what was going to happen. And Jonathan then is the one who comes by his side. And he tells him when he's going to come to kill him. So chapters 19 to 27 then involve Saul pursuing David and trying to kill him. 
but David continually sparing the life of Saul. I don't know if we could do that. Someone's trying to kill you, and you have chances to, to get your revenge, and David would not. There's several stories talking about uh, this cat and mouse game that's going on, but the key thing to important to remember is this. God's protecting his anointed king, and nothing will be able to harm David at this point other than his own sin, which we see that coming in 2 Samuel. Calvin writes about this episode of David sparing the life of Saul when he had the opportunity to kill him and get his revenge. This is chapters 24 and chapter 26. We read this. And, and Calvin writes, David was already chosen by God as king and anointed with his holy oil when he was wickedly persecuted by Saul without just cause. Nevertheless, he considered Saul's head holy and sacred for the Lord had sanctified him with the majesty of kingship. As David says, I will never lay hands on the Lord's Christ, the anointed one. And in chapter 25, Samuel dies. We hear about the, the death of Samuel. Just one, one line, Samuel's now gone. But he makes an appearance a little bit later. And there's this crazy story about a man named Nabal, who is, uh, he insults David, he insults his soldiers, he asks them to, to help feed them, and Nabal said, no, what am I going to do? Yeah, you know, basically told him to get out of here. And David said to his men to strap on your swords. We're going to go get him and kill everything that he has. He insulted the Lord and the Lord's army. But his wife, Abigail, very wise, she comes and she basically comes with a peace offering. She comes and, and feeds the troops and she continually praises David, knows that he's the Lord's anointed, and David's anger subsides. And what happens then, uh, because of this, Her grace and her uh, language that she uses, you can read that for yourself in chapter 25. But she kind of quiets the wrath of God and keeps him from murdering her husband and his men. And as a result, uh, Nabal ends up dying and then she becomes David's wife, Abigail. In 27, chapter 27, this cat and mouse game story going on and David gets so desperate that he flees to the Philistines, the enemy of Israel. And he's taking refuge because he's so despondent about what's been going on that he goes to the enemy and he goes to King Achish of Gath. This is a town in, uh, along the Mediterranean. And the King Achish, who he, had, he knew David from an earlier episode, and he says of David, he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel because now he's with the enemy and they're not going to trust him. He says, he will be my servant always. But we know that's not true. But David and his men actually lived in Philistine territory for about a year and a half because he was being hunted down by Saul and Saul's army. So, I want to take a little detour here. In the Psalms, particularly I'm going to look at two, Psalm 18 and Psalm 56, David is writing about this time period. And I want you to listen to his heart. As David, uh, in Psalm 18... Look at the first six verses here and then 49 and 50 at the end. And this is when he is running from Saul, hiding from Saul. And listen how he starts out this song. He says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am safe from my enemies. The cords of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol, the place of the dead, entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. Isn't that wonderful that we would be in that position like when we're so troubled and distressed that we call to the Lord and praise him like that, even amidst a time of, of deep and dark depression. He ends with this. He says, verse 49 and 50 of Psalm 18, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. All right? That's key. Forever. And then over in Psalm 56, a couple of verses here. Again, he's... Uh, He's, being, he's in Philistine territory, hiding from Saul. 
And he says, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And over in verse 10, In God, whose word I praise, in Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? See the faith he has as the Lord's anointed. The Lord's protecting him, even among his trials and tribulations that he's going through. We come to chapter 28, and this is the final nail in the coffin of Saul. You know, that he, he had outlawed all the witches and, and, and the occult within the kingdom, but there were still a few hanging around. His men knew where they were. So Saul is in a desperate situation. He's up against the Philistines once again, and his heart is troubled. He's fearful, it says in the Scripture. His heart troubled greatly. He consults the Lord. There's no response. The Lord's left him. He's betrayed him. Saul's betrayed the Lord, and the Lord said, you're on your own now. And so in a desperate situation, he finds a, basically a witch, uh, a woman who's a medium, a necromancer, one who consults the dead. And uh, he disguises himself and goes and visits this woman. And <laughs> she says, who do you want me to, uh, to bring up? He goes, I want you to bring up Samuel. And all of a sudden, she lets out a, sh a shriek because she didn't do this. She didn't bring up Samuel. God did. God brought Samuel back to make a word again to Saul to say, this is it. And this is what he said. He says, um, Samuel appears and his words of doom for Saul. The Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me in Sheol, in the place of the dead. Very prophetic words. And it comes crashing down then. Chapter 31, we read the end. And Samuel's words from beyond come true. Chapter 31, verses 1 to 7. It says, The Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. And Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died and his three sons and his armor-bearer and all his men on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were with them on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. That's the end of Saul. As Samuel told him from beyond the grave, this would happen to you. And so Saul's kingship begins pretty well for a short time, very short time, but soon became dark and dysfunctional. And that's what Samuel had warned him about. If you bring in this king, if he doesn't follow the Lord, this is what's going to happen to him. God was working behind the scenes. So we see Samuel come onto the scene, replaces the, the, the Eli who was weak and his wicked sons. He becomes a leader in Israel. The people demand a king. They give him Saul. Saul flames out, crashes and burns, and this paves the way for David, the man after the Lord's own heart. Interestingly, I mentioned earlier that Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. David's from the tribe of Judah. Okay? The line of the tribe of Judah, describing our Christ. Despite the chaos of Saul's reign, the way is now prepared for the Messianic ruler David, whose greatest son has become the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Alpha and the Omega, whose kingdom will never end. And so that's how God works. And then next week we look at 2 Samuel. Basically it would be about the kingship of, of David. Um, that's the story of 1 Samuel. A lot of action there. A little bit something for everybody. No matter what you like, it was there. If you like, you know, you like uh, intrigue, 
you like the spy game, you like consulting the occult, it's all there for you in the book of 1 Samuel. But the main thing you want to take from this is the Lord was protecting his anointed and those who trust in the Lord. And you saw those words from David, even when he was in a desperate situation, he cries out to the Lord, he puts his faith there. And that's where we have to be. And good words for us in times of difficulty and trouble that we would consult the Lord and put our faith in Him uh, and His truth. Any questions or comments?